All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks very much for your patience today. I do have quite a bit to read out at the top, and then we'll get right to your questions. Uh, earlier today, Secretary Austin hosted Israeli Minister of Defense Yoav Gallant here at the Pentagon to discuss efforts to de-escalate tensions along the Israel-Lebanon border, to surge more humanitarian aid into Gaza, and to stand together against Iranian and Iranian-supported attacks against Israel and destabilizing activities throughout the Middle East. Secretary Austin underscored the ironclad U.S. commitment to Israel, as evidenced in part by the extraordinary defense of Israel against an unprecedented Iranian attack on April 13, and by the more than $14 billion in assistance in the National Security Supplemental. During the discussion, Secretary Austin stressed that Lebanese Hezbollah's provocations threatened to drag the Israeli and Lebanese people into a war that neither of them wants, and that such a war would be catastrophic for Lebanon, and it would be devastating for innocent Israeli and Lebanese civilians. Secretary Austin also reiterated the high priority of securing the safe release of all hostages held captive by Hamas, including American citizens. He commended Minister Gallant for Israel's support for the comprehensive ceasefire and hostage release proposal that it has offered, which President Biden has outlined and the United Nations Security Council has endorsed. They agree that the onus is on Hamas to accept this deal. Secretary Austin stressed that principled diplomacy is the only way to prevent any further escalation of tensions in the region. Additionally, Secretary Austin urged Minister Gallant to double down on efforts to protect Palestinian civilians and humanitarian aid workers in Gaza. The Secretary and Minister discussed ways to improve the distribution of humanitarian aid to Palestinian civilians in dire need and to strengthen the deconfliction mechanisms for humanitarian workers. A full readout will be posted to the DOD website later today. Separately, Secretary Austin also spoke by phone today with Russian Minister of Defense Andrei Belusov. During the call, the Secretary emphasized the importance of maintaining lines of communication amid Russia's ongoing war against Ukraine. The last time Secretary Austin spoke to his Russian counterpart, then Russian Minister of Defense Sergei Shoigu, was on March 15, 2023. A brief readout will be posted to defense.gov. In other news, today the department released its new information technology advancement strategy <clears throat> titled Fulcrum. The Fulcrum strategy provides a roadmap for better aligning DOD's IT capabilities and resources to accelerate the department's modernization efforts and expand our military's strategic advantage across the IT landscape. Fulcrum will assist the department in continuing the transformative change occurring throughout DOD's IT enterprise while empowering DOD leaders to deliver advanced IT capabilities for our warfighters. Of note, Fulcrum will also assist the department in our ongoing efforts to recruit, develop, uh, and develop the best digital talent the country has to offer. A press release with further details on Fulcrum, along with a link to, this, to the full strategy, is available on the DOD website. Also, last Friday marked one year since the launch of the India-U.S. Defense Acceleration Ecosystem, or Indus-X. Indus X is one of the ways DOD continues to help advance the initiative on critical and emerging technology between our two countries. Together with the Indian Ministry of Defense, we're facilitating dynamic partnerships among defense technology companies, investors, and researchers. We've already convened two Indus X summits, one here in Washington and another in New Delhi. And the White House just announced that a third Indus X summer, a summit will take place this September in Silicon Valley. We're very proud of what this initiative has achieved in just one year, and we're excited for what's ahead. A detailed fact sheet on Indus X is available on the DOD website. And finally, as you may have seen, we posted a statement from Secretary Austin yesterday announcing that Derek Chalet will start in July as the Secretary's Chief of Staff. Mr. Chalet has served in senior policy roles at the White House, the Pentagon, and the Department of State, including his current role as Counselor of the Department of State. In his statement, Secretary Austin expressed his gratitude to Mr. Chalet for taking on this key assignment at such an important moment. And as previously announced, Kelly Magsman, the current Chief of Staff, will depart this week after three and a half years in the position since the very first day of this administration. As Secretary Austin said in his June 5 statement, he's deeply grateful for her tremendous service over three and a half pivotal years to him, the department, and the country as the Chief of Staff. So on behalf of the Secretary and the entire Office of the Secretary of Defense, we all wish her the very best as she takes some time off before pursuing other opportunities. And with that, I'll take your questions. Tara. 
All right, that was a lot. Um, I wanted to ask about the humanitarian assistance for Gaza. Is there a role for DOD, particularly with the coordination cell? You have um, some warnings today from the UN that they will just pull out of distributing aid if more is not done to protect those that are distributing it. Yeah, so um, you know there, there is a role uh, when it comes to getting aid into Gaza for the Department of Defense, and it's exactly what we're doing. Uh, we are working with uh, the U.S. interagency as well as uh, other international agencies and partners to facilitate the flow of aid into Gaza. Uh, certainly, you know, as I highlighted uh, during the discussion today with Minister Gallant, uh, that was on the agenda was to discuss ways to, to ensure that aid can get to the people who need it most. Uh, but, you know, from a DOD standpoint, uh, to get to the crux of your question, uh, there's no plans, for example, to put U.S. military forces on the ground in, in Gaza. We're going to continue to work with humanitarian organizations via USAID uh, and other regional uh, partners to ensure that, that we can find a way to get that aid to the people who need it most. But is there more potentially that could be done through the coordination cell? Because some of the concerns or complaints is that they don't have enough direct communication with IDF. Well, again, you know, as I as I mentioned here, you know, that that's one aspect of it is, is looking at those mechanisms. I think probably the most important aspect, though, would be uh, the other thing that I mentioned, which is uh, a ceasefire and the onus is on Hamas. So if a ceasefire uh, could be put into place right now, that would greatly facilitate uh, this, the security and uh, safety considerations on the ground, which would further facilitate the flow of aid. Tom? Uh, Pat, could you, uh, along these lines, could you give us an update on the pier? Is it still uh, moving aid? If so, how much? And also, again, if the UN decides to stop delivering aid, um, what does that mean for the operation of the pier? Will you curtail the amount of aid you're send sending to the Marshall area? Will you stop? Does that have an effect on your operations? Yeah, so a few things. Uh, so first of all, yes, uh, the, the pier is operational. It resumed uh, operations uh, again today. As you know, yesterday they took uh, a day to do some scheduled maintenance on the pier, but but the bottom line is, yes, it's operational. Aid is flowing across the causeway. Um, CENTCOM, you know, per standard, will be issuing updates in terms of the, the amounts. I can tell you uh, right now, to date, since May 17th, they've delivered more than 6,800 metric tons or 15 million pounds of humanitarian aid ashore for onward delivery. Now, your question about uh, the amount of aid. Again, back to my uh, earlier comment. You know, the, the DOD is working with uh, the interagency and international NGOs to facilitate the delivery of aid. And so that's our role in this is to help get the aid there, whether it's via the maritime corridor, whether it's via uh, air or, you know, preferably land routes. Uh, and so, again, we're going to we're going to continue to work with those agencies who are the ones that are out there that are doing the hard work to to facil facilitate those donations. Um, but bottom line is we'll be standing ready uh, to help get the aid there. Now, last thing I'll say on that is, uh, again, to underscore, you know, uh, this is a temporary peer. So this is a uh, temporary solution to help rush aid into the zone. Uh, again, recognizing the, the dire security situation there. Um, but again, we're going to continue to look at all ways to get aid but, but into again, Gaza. If, if the UN stops delivering food, will you just continue moving humanitarian aid to that marshalling area? Or you basically say, if they're not delivering aid, we're going to have to at some point stop? Um, I mean, certainly uh, we've got to take into account uh, the, the capacity of the marshalling area. We're not quite there yet. Um, so, you know, again, we're going to continue to be in communication with the UN, uh, with the World Food Program, USAID, and look at those things. Ultimately, though, I think we all want uh, the same thing, which is to make sure aid can get to the people who need it in Gaza. Idris? Um, you mentioned uh, civilian casualties was an issue that was discussed this morning between Austin and Gallant. Did the Secretary receive any commitment or assurances from the Israeli Defense Minister to reduce civilian casualties? Um, you know, I'm not going to be able to go into more details than what I provided in, in that readout there, Idris, other than to say again, you know, and, and I don't want to speak for Minister Gallant, um, other than to say again that, that this is a priority for Secretary Austin in terms of protecting civilians, uh, and that is something that has come up in every single conversation that they have. Secretary, you let it's a priority for the Israelis as well? Uh, I'm not going to, again, uh, characterize 
Minister Gallant's words. I think the secretary uh, recognizes that his message is being received uh, loud and clear. Uh, and again, we're going to continue to uh, highlight how important it is. I mean, you heard it in his opening comments, right? It's it's both a, uh, a, a moral obligation and a strategic imperative. So the Russian defense minister, who initiated the call? Uh, the secretary did. Well, yep, let me go to you, sir. Yeah, Rashid Jafar al TV, Egypt. Uh, the Secretary has indicated that diplomacy is the best way to prevent the recent uh, tensions between Lebanon and uh, between uh, Hezbollah and Israel from escalating into a full-blown war. What has been discussed uh, in the talks between the Secretary and his Israeli counterpart on this issue? Well, again, as I highlighted at, at the top, um, you know, w we think uh, that uh, no one wins if there's a broader regional conflict. Uh, and so that's something that the Department of Defense in the United States has been working very hard at ever since Hamas's attack on October 7th. Uh, and so uh, the secretary uh, has been clear both publicly and privately that uh, we firmly believe that a diplomatic resolution to the tensions along the Israel-Lebanon uh, border uh, are, are the way to go uh, and to prevent uh, a potential a potential escalation, uh, and especially in this type of situation where there's a risk of miscalculation uh, that that no one wants to see. So let me go to the phone here real quick. Uh, Laura Seligman, Politico. Hi, Pat. Thanks for doing this. Can you tell me what was the impetus for Secretary Austin's call with the Russian Defense Minister? Thanks, Laura. Uh, I'm not going to have anything to provide uh, beyond what I read out at the top, other than, again, uh, the secretary believes that uh, keeping lines of communication uh, open are important. All right, let me go to uh, Jeff Shogel, Task and Purpose. Uh, thank you. Uh, former President Trump has criticized the military for going for moving toward electric tanks. Uh, as far as you know, is there are there any plans for electric tanks? Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Um, seeing those press reports, I'm I'm not aware of any uh, electric tanks. I certainly, refer you to the Army for any questions about their acquisitions programs. Um, just leave it there, Janie. Thank you, General. I have uh, two questions on uh, North Korea, Russia, and uh, Ukraine. First question, Russian President Putin recognized the North Korea as a nuclear state. And the U.S. Congress is also talking about uh, arming South Korea uh, with nuclear weapons in response to North Korea's nuclear weapons. What is the Pentagon's uh, view on the South Korea's should arm itself with nuclear weapons? Yeah, look, our, our policy hasn't changed uh, as it relates to the uh, denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Uh, you know, again, we'll continue to work closely with our ROK uh, Japanese uh, allies and others in the region uh, to ensure security and stability throughout the Indo-Pacific. And I'll just leave it there. Quick uh, follow-up. Uh, North Korea's Central Military Commission announced that North Korea would join forces with the Russian military. And uh, as part of the North Korea and Russia military alliance, the North Korean Army Engineer Unit would be dispatched to Donetsk, Ukraine, which means occupied by Russia. Uh, it will be dispatched as uh, early as next month. How do you assess about the rapid situation in which North Korea and Russia are moving toward Ukraine? So just to clarify, you're asking what do I think about Russia assigning North Korean forces to the battlefield in Ukraine? I mean, North Korean army. Gonna yeah, be, sending North... Yeah, I mean, that's certainly something to uh, to keep an eye on. Um, I think that um, if, if I, you know, if I were North Korean military personnel management, I would be questioning my choices on uh, sending my forces to be cannon fodder uh, in an illegal war against Ukraine. Um, and we've seen the kinds of casualties that Russian forces. Um, so 
um, but again, uh, something that we'll keep an eye on. Let me, let me move on, Janie. Yes, sir. Thank you, General. Um, regarding to the uh, escalation of the border between uh, Lebanon and Israel, do you still uh, believe that the uh, diplomatic uh, resolution uh, is still possible? And uh, today, the, after the meeting between uh, Secretary Austin and his Israeli counterpart, uh, uh, did you see that the Israeli agree to go with uh, with the Secretary Austin assessment about the, this solution as a diplomatic? Do they agree with that path? And uh, even though did they agree with the, what uh, Secretary Austin says about that, any another war between Hezbollah and uh, Israel could easily become a regional war. Yeah, again, I'm, I'm not going to speak for Minister Gallant uh, or the Israeli delegation. I'll, I'll allow them to do that. Uh, but to answer your question, yes, we do think uh, that a diplomatic resolution is possible. Uh, and that's something that we'll continue to work with all parties involved uh, on to, to achieve for the reasons that I spelled out. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, General Pat. My name is Mushfiq al Fazal. I'm representing South Asia Perspectives. May I know how the Pentagon navigating its military and security partnership with Bangladesh, given the U.S. public designation of immediate past Army Chief of Bangladesh, General Aziz, due to his involvement in significant corruption, the country is moving in the wrong direction with extreme violation of human rights and democratic rights. Top police and RAB personnel have been sanctioned by the U.S., and the current regime is using the security forces to keep the power by any means. Yeah, thanks for the question, uh, and welcome to the to the briefing room here. I, as you're aware, uh, and as you highlighted, the State Department uh, has designated General Ahmed for significant corruption. They did this back in May. Uh, that designation reaffirms the U.S. commitment to strengthening democratic institutions and the rule of law in Bangladesh, and the department supports the anti-corruption efforts that are being taken there. Uh, and I would just, you know, conclude by saying that the U.S. does have a close bilateral defense relationship with Bangladesh in support of shared values and interests, such as a shared free and open Indo-Pacific and maritime and, and regional security. So just leave it there. Liz? Thanks. Uh, there's a report out that the Biden administration is considering allowing U.S. military contractors in Ukraine to help maintain U.S. provided weapon systems in Ukraine um, without getting into hypotheticals of what could be decided. Um, what's the difference between doing this and having U.S. military boots on the ground? Yeah, thanks for the question, Liz. Um, what I'd say right now is just I'm not going to comment on any reports of uh, internal discussions or proposals that may or may not be under consideration. You know, the bottom line is uh, the president uh, and the secretary have been clear that we're not going to send U.S. troops to fight in Ukraine, and that won't change. So I'll just leave it there. Okay. Sir. Um, regarding the DOD uh, Inspector General report on tracking funds to China for pathogen research, uh, the report men mentions there are, quote, significant restraints in order to track those, those funds. So will there be any revisions made in the future to accurately track those? Um, let me take that question. I just don't have that information in front of me, so we'll get back to you on it. Body. Thank you, General. So uh, Minister Gallant uh, said today that the U.S. and Israel are working to achieve an agreement uh, about the tension on the borders between Israel and Lebanon, but he added, we must uh, also discuss readiness for every possible scenario. Did the Secretary um, discuss such uh, scenarios with uh, Mr. Gallant? I think he was alluding to uh, war, maybe? Well, again, I, uh, as you can appreciate, I'm not going to speak for uh, Minister Gallant or his comments. I will say, again, uh, that they did have a discussion about the tensions along the Israel-Lebanon border. Uh, the secretary, uh, again, highlighted uh, the importance of finding a diplomatic resolution to those tensions. Uh, you know, it was a very frank, candid, professional conversation uh, and, uh, and robust. Uh, so uh, lots of discussion on the, the situation as it relates to Lebanon. Um, but I'll just leave it there. And, and the Secretary uh, thanked uh, Mr. Gallant for his efforts to uh, increase the flow of humanitarian aid to Gaza. However, today the integrated food security phase said, class said that 2.5 million uh, Palestinians in Gaza uh, face uh, uh, high levels of acute food insecurity and half a million are facing starvation. 
Was the secretary aware of these statistics before making his comments? And can you uh, uh, point to any specific uh, efforts that he was uh, talking about on, uh, uh, on uh, from Mr. Gallant to uh, make sure food is actually and it is actually getting to the people of Gaza? Yeah. Uh, and, and again, with the caveat that I'm not Israel MOD spokesperson and, and I'm not going to stand up here and be Minister Gallant spokesperson, what the secretary was alluding to is the fact that, you know, first of all, uh, Israel is not a monolith. Uh, and Minister Gallant has, uh, from the secretary's perspective, has worked hard to enable uh, the mechanisms by which uh, humanitarian assistance can get into Gaza. Uh, for example, uh, working to ensure that uh, aid can uh, get past protesters, for example, on the Israeli side into Gaza, working to uh, get the gates open, supporting JLOTs in terms of providing security so that JLOTs can be anchored to the pier, and then, of course, uh, supporting the, the coordination cell that exists. Uh, so from Secretary Austin's perspective, Minister Gallant has been a partner we can work with in terms of identifying ways to get aid into Gaza, recognizing the challenges that still exist there, recognizing the fact that much, much more aid needs to get in. So this will be something that they continue to, to talk about. Eunice. Thank you, General. Uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu said that Israel is ready to fight two wars on two fronts. And today, the Israeli um, Defense Minister said in the room um, that they're determined to uh, actually establish security in the north and change the reality on the ground. So if that were to happen with seeing from the Secretary that it's not a hypothetical anymore, but a calculation in this department that it could turn into a full-blown war in the region, if that were to happen, uh, can Israel rely on the United States militarily? Because we've seen this play out before that you said one thing Israel did another, but you were still behind them militarily. So can that yeah. still be the case? So I appreciate the question, uh, and I will respectfully uh, disagree that it's not a hypothetical. It is a hypothetical. I mean, certainly that is a scenario uh, that could happen, but it hasn't yet. And so our focus right now uh, is on finding a diplomatic solution to the tensions that are along the, the border there. Um, and, you know, um, as I highlighted at the top, uh, our support for Israel's inherent right to self-defense is ironclad. It will remain that way. We'll continue to support Israel and their ability to defend themselves. But when it comes to the tensions along the border, when it comes to the broader region, we don't want to see a broader regional conflict. And so that will continue to be a primary focus of this department and this government. Thank you. Take a few more. Yes, sir. Yeah, thank you. Um, I have a question on a different topic. Uh, about the launches of the Russian satellite to space, the Cosmos satellite 2576. Um, there are supposed to be no pair. And um, the question is, where the Pentagon is standing with the nuclear anti-satellite program? And uh, if the Pentagon is also looking on a new cold, I mean, not looking, but you know, is aware there might be on the verge or a new cold war in space against Russia and China. Well, yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, you know, so the bottom line is um, we recognize uh, that space is now congested and contested, right? You know, it's not the benign environment that it used to be. Uh, and there are actors uh, that are looking to, uh, you know, create conditions in space that threaten uh, not only U.S. national security interests, but, but other countries as well. Uh, and so our focus is on uh, protecting our capabilities, uh, but also ensuring that space uh, doesn't become uh, the kind of battleground that, that you suggest. Uh, so is there a Cold War in space right now? No. Um, but it's certainly something that we will need to continue to stay very focused on, which is why you saw, in our case, the U.S. military create a U.S. Space Force several years ago so that you have uh, Space Force guardians who come to work every single day with the primary job of keeping an eye on the space domain to not only ensure we understand what's in space, but also protect uh, our interests uh, and, importantly, working with our allies and partners around the world to do the same. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. First of all, briefing with you uh, right, well. from the Pakistan Daily. So, government of Pakistan announced a new military operation against the uh, Pakistani Taliban and allied groups. Some of them believed are also wanted for China. For example, East Turkestan Islamic Movement. So, uh, 
United States before and after the Doha agreement um, showed its commitment to go after IS, IS and linked groups like ISKP who is actively working with Pakistani Taliban and attacking civilians of Pakistan and uh, also there are concerns from Chinese side. So do you think so? Um, still, uh, th th there is like United States, uh, United States have something with uh, Pakistani military on this operation or United States is aware about this, Pentagon is aware about this. Yeah, well, first, first of all, welcome. Um, what I would tell you is, I, you know, I don't have any specifics as it relates to particular Pakistani operations, counter-terror operations. I would say, broadly speaking, uh, you know, we, we fully appreciate and recognize Pakistan's important role as a uh, partner when it comes to counterterrorism. We have a long history of, of working together on counterterrorism uh, efforts. Uh, and when it comes to uh, regional terrorist threats, it's certainly something that we continue to keep an eye on, uh, especially, in, you know, for obvious reasons as it relates to protecting U.S. national security interests and protecting the homeland. Uh, but the way that we do that is uh, we don't do that alone. We work with allies and partners throughout the world to assess those threats and take appropriate action. So, uh, again, I don't have any specifics on the operations that you're talking about, uh, but I'm confident that at multiple levels, we're in contact with the Pakistani government as well as other partners in the region to address potential terrorist threats. Thank you. Ro. Thank you, General. Um, in Okinawa, Japan, local authorities said that prosecutors charged a U.S. serviceman at the Air Force in Okinawa for allegedly sexually assaulting a girl under 16 years old in March, and it was revealed yesterday. Could you give us comment on this case, and what do you think about the potential impact on the U.S.-Japan relation? Yeah, unfortunately, I just I don't have any details on that. I'd, I'd have to refer you to, uh, you said it was Air Force? Yeah. Yeah, I'd have to refer you to the Air Force for, for any questions on that. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Hi, sir. Uh, Kimberly Underwood from FCS Signal Magazine. I wanted to ask about the Fulcrum strategy. As DOD convince, continues to advance strategies and the digital workforce through the strategies, are there any broad areas that the Secretary will need to iron out as far as IT or C4 technologies, um, you know, to take DOD into the future? And then I had a quick Indus uh, 3 question follow-up. Sure. Um, I'm, I'm going to take your question because I want to get you uh, a, a proper answer on that, but uh, appreciate it. And for Indus 3, do you have any, uh, would the Secretary have any advice to Silicon Valley companies about participating in the event or companies that may be interested in understanding um, the Indus partnership? Yeah, well, you know, just broadly speaking, um, especially when you look at the challenges that the department is facing around the world today as we implement the national defense strategy. I mean, it, it's clear that that the partnership between the Department of Defense and industry is vital, and, and you see this on, on multiple levels. Uh, and for example, through programs like DIU or Indus X or, you know, many, many others, um, it's critical that we be able to to work together to understand each other's requirements uh, and so you know that's going to continue to be a priority for this department so thank you very much I'll take two more yes sir yeah hi so as uh, you guys celebrate a year of Indus X um, it is also a year anniversary of my colleague Vivek Raghubanshi um, being detained by Indian authorities for the crime of journalism and um, so as you all celebrate, you know, this partnership with India, what conversations or certain assurances has the Pentagon pursued um, from India on press freedom and human rights in exchange for all of these partnerships? Yeah, well, certainly, I, you know, I know uh, that our State Department has spoken to this, you know, broadly speaking, uh, again, from a Department of Defense standpoint, we certainly uh, support uh, and will defend a open, free, and independent press. That's our position. Um, so I'll just leave it there. No, last question. Uh, a couple of short ones on the call with the Russian Defense Minister today. Could you tell us about how long it lasted? And then secondarily, since the focus was in large part, you said, on maintaining lines of communication, uh, how would you characterize those lines of communication right now? Yeah, thanks, Noah. Uh, I, I do appreciate the question. I'm just not going to have any more details to provide than, than what I provided to you. All right. Thanks very much, everybody. Appreciate it.